This program is sponsored by The Church of God International and supported by our viewers. In today's world, there is an obvious growing movement to secularize our society and the outlook of mankind. Over the past few decades, humanism has emerged as this new solution, the means by which humanity will be able to accomplish its objectives and resolve all of its global problems. Well, with the advent of the technological development that has occurred over the last 50 years, knowledge has indeed exploded in many different areas. Why today's industrial community has focused on robotics, artificial intelligence, and yes, even nanotechnology that affords the infusion of human biology and machine. Yes, a cyborg species that looks to achieving immortality. But can this be possible? Is mankind really capable of developing a process that would sustain his life forever? Well, on today's program, we're going to explore these questions and address some of the missing factors that mankind is ignoring and if not embraced, will only prevent his effort to attain happiness and eternal life. So stay with us as we address Christianity versus humanism. In times like these, we need the armor of God for the well-being of our families, to help you stand in the evil day. The Church of God International presents Armor of God, a program of biblical understanding. And now your host, Mike James. Hi, welcome to another edition of the Armor of God. Thanks for joining us on today's program. What we're going to discuss today is the battle being waged for the minds of man between Christianity and humanism. When you think about Christianity, create a relationship with Jesus Christ, follow Jesus Christ, that's going to get you somewhere in life. When you think of humanism, again, the bare bones of humanism, man can do it all himself. Man does not need God. Man can take care of himself and enjoy life that way. I want to begin by discussing a book that I've read, and the title of this book is Homo Deus, and the author is a fellow named Yuval Harari. Now, Harari wrote another book called Sapiens, which made the New York Times bestseller list, and this book kind of takes off from where Sapiens left off. It begins to look at man's history, not only right now, what's happening with man right now, but what he projects to be happening with man as we move into the future. And he revolves his book around three major points, that man right now is working on extending his life, or as some call it, trying to become immortal. A second thing that man is working on right now is trying to achieve ultimate happiness. And a third thing that he discusses in his book is man is trying to achieve God-like qualities or to become a God to himself. Now, when you think of those three ideas, I find them in the Bible, but God lets us know that to achieve immortality, to get ultimate happiness, and to become God-like or part of the God family, you've got to go through God to do that. What Harari is saying in the book is man is trying to do it himself, and he definitely looks at it from a humanistic perspective. But let's go back to Genesis 3 just for a moment so I can show you these three ideas right here at the beginning of the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 3, and we know the serpent is speaking to Eve here, and I'm going to pick it up in verse 3 of Genesis 3. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. So Satan is letting the woman know, hey, you won't die if you eat of this fruit. Again, that concept of man being able to become immortal on his own. Then verse 5, 
For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And there's point number two. Satan gets into this conversation about, hey, you can be like God. Now, interestingly enough, in verse 22 of Genesis 3, the Lord says this, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat, and live forever. So God was putting a stop to man becoming more like him, but the possibility is definitely there, even in God's mind. But let's get to that third concept here in verse 6, the ultimate happiness part of what we're discussing. Verse 6, And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate it. There's that idea of ultimate happiness. The tree looks good. It's desirous. Let me eat it. It tastes good. And that's what humanism has been telling man, that, hey, if it feels good, do it. We're going to look at this battle between Christianity and humanism, and we hope that you stay tuned. Before we do that, though, I want to offer you some free literature, and I also want to offer you a CD on today's program. The literature that I'd like to offer you today is titled, Why Christ Must Return. We need Christ to return to set this world straight. As we all know, there are myriad problems on the earth today that are only going to be solved by Christ and not by man. We also want to offer you the CD titled, Maintaining Happiness. Since man has been on the earth, he has been trying to find ultimate happiness. The only way to achieve ultimate happiness is through Jesus Christ. Please get this full-length sermon CD, Maintaining Happiness, and the booklet, Why Christ Must Return. To get both of these items free of charge, all you need to do is call us toll-free at 1-888-578-8791. That's 1-888-578-8791. Or you can order by visiting our website. Go to www.cgi.org. www.cgi.org. To learn more about our weekly sermon broadcast, go to www. Dot CGI dot org. Thanks again for joining us on today's program. Again, we're looking at this battle between Christianity and humanism, and we're focusing it in on three primary ideas or concepts that the humanist mindset is working on right now, and as we go into the future, may advance in these three particular areas. One of these areas is man trying to become immortal in a sense. Believe it or not, there are men on this earth today who believe one day man can make himself immortal. Now that goes up against what God says, that the only way to immortality is through God and a relationship with Jesus Christ. But let me try to set this up for you. In Yuval Harari's book, Homo Deus, he gets into these three concepts. And here's what he says about man trying to make himself immortal. In the book, he's quoted as saying this, We don't need to wait for the second coming to overcome death. A couple geeks in a lab can do it. Now you might say, well, what do you mean? How can a couple geeks in a lab do this? Well, let me let you know what a couple geeks in a lab may think about this. Uh, Ray Kurzweil who is the director of engineering at Google, has created a sub-company to Google called Calico. And the primary mission statement of this company, the stated goal of this company called Calico, is to solve death. Yes, that is their stated goal. They want to solve death. And they are putting a lot of money into trying to achieve that particular outcome. Uh, another fellow named Aubrey de Grey, he's a gerontologist, and he believes, as does Mr. Kurzweil, that by 2050, medical technology will be advancing to such a degree that you can go into your doctor's office 
every 10 years and kind of get a tune-up for your body. So you go in and they'll regenerate your skin. They'll make changes to your hands. They'll fix your eyes. And they will do things with nanotechnology inside of your body to get rid of any disease or whatever might be infecting your body. And that technology will increase in its size and scope every 10 years after that that you can go back into the doctor's office and get regenerated for another 10 years. Now they're saying this and what they're saying is they believe in the near future, in the next 50 to 100 years, that they're going to have people living for 200 years, 300 years, 400 years because of the advances in medical technology. Now there are people that say no, that, that won't happen. But there are others who believe that it will happen and they're putting a lot of money into making that happen. Now, what does the Bible have to say about achieving immortality? Well, it says, yes, you can achieve immortality, but you can only do it through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And let me just go to one scripture. It's over in Romans chapter 6, and I'm going to look at verse 23 there. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yeah, you can get immortality, folks, but you can't get it through man's means. You have to go through Jesus Christ to attain immortality. Now, the second major point or project that Harari believes man is working on and man is trying to uh, lead us into a future with is ultimate happiness. And man is doing a lot of things today to achieve ultimate happiness. Now, if we look at the history of man, we will see famous philosophers like the Greek Epicurus, who said that ultimate happiness was the highest achievement that man could reach. We've had philosophers like the British philosopher Jeremy Bentham, who believed in the same way. We have guys like John Stuart Mill, another philosopher, who talked about this. And you could definitely consider Mr. Mill a humanist. And let me just quote something that John Stuart Mill said. He said, happiness is nothing but pleasure and freedom from pain. Beyond pleasure and pain, there is no good and evil. Anyone who tries to deduce good and evil from something like the Word of God is fooling you. Now that's Mr. Mill saying that. I, of course, believe diametrically opposite of what Mr. Mill has to say. I believe the answers to ultimate happiness, the answers to immortality, the answers to becoming part of the God family are in your Bible and can only be found through a relationship with Jesus Christ. But these humanistic thinkers, I believe, have influenced the thinking of humans today. And let me give you a couple examples of what I'm talking about here. If man's trying to achieve ultimate happiness, how's he doing it? He's doing it in many ways. We have all these creature comforts today, and I'm not against those types of things. The automobile, all of the things in your modern kitchen today, uh, clean water, much more so than in the past. All of these things definitely enhance our life and make our life a little bit happier, but we still are not ultimately happy, are we? Other things that man is trying to do today is taking pills to make himself happy. Whether it's Cialis or Viagra, whether it is taking opioids not to feel any pain, and let me show you about some of the dangers of this. I want to give you a little bit of information about the amount of children in the United Kingdom who are taking Ritalin today. In 1997, we have statistics that say that 92,000 children in the United Kingdom were taking Ritalin for attention deficit disorder in 1997. In 2012, that number had jumped seven times. In 2012, 786,000 children in the United Kingdom were taking Ritalin for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Now ask yourself this question. Do you think the amount of children who became hyperactive increased that much in 15 years? 
Or do you think the mindset of man today is, I don't want to deal with that problem, let's give the kid a pill. Or, and even with the doctors, we're finding there's many doctors out there today who are saying we've overprescribed antibiotics. We've given people too many antibiotics too quickly. And what it's led to is a diminishing in the power of our antibiotics. Now hear me out. If you need medicine, take your medicine. I'm not saying we shouldn't be taking medicine. But what I'm saying is, the reason we have a lot of drug abuse today, the reason we have 60,000 people in the United States dying from opioid abuse today is because of the ease we have in getting drugs. And what do drugs do? They make you happy if you are not happy in some sort of way. And again, I believe humanism has pushed man in that particular direction. What does the Bible say about ultimate happiness? The Bible says life is full of a little suffering. You're going to have to suffer a little, but through the suffering, you gain the character that is needed to get into that ultimate happiness, which is the kingdom of God. Let me show you a scripture that bears this out. Over in the book of Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, let me pick it up in verse 3 there. It says, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed. What's the Bible saying here? It's saying, hey, you got to go through some stuff to become better, to build your character. And that is the story of the Bible. What did God tell man back in Genesis? He says, you're going to have to work by the sweat of your brow now. You're going to have to suffer a little in order to survive. Women are going to have to feel some pain in childbearing in order to get by. He said pain is going to give you something, and that's part of life. But what humanism is saying today is pleasure is what it's all about. If it feels good, do it, and get as much pleasure as you can. That's the road to ruin, folks. The road to enlightenment, the road to happiness, is going through a little suffering and coming out on the other side of that. There are a number of other scriptures that bear this out. Over in the book of Micah, chapter 4, I'm going to begin reading a little bit about what the kingdom of God is like, and that's ultimate happiness. You want ultimate happiness, get a relationship with Jesus Christ, and that'll get you into the kingdom of God. Listen to what that kingdom's going to be like. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us His ways, and we will walk in His paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Won't that be great when there is no more war? That will lead to happy people. And then finally, verse 4. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. We will have enough to eat. We will be not fearful anymore. And when you look at crime and, and the rampant worries that people have in this life, this is how to get the ultimate happiness through the kingdom of God. Another scripture that bears this out about the suffering that you have to go through in order to come out on the other side is over in the book of First Peter. And let me go ahead and read that to you. Again, this flies in the face of what the humanists are saying that, hey, let's be happy. Let's make ourselves as happy as we can by doing anything we can for that happiness. In 1 Peter 5 and verse 10, it says, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. Humanism says pleasure 
happiness is the ultimate good in life, but your Bible says there's going to be some suffering. There's going to be some trials you have to go through which will refine you and build your character and make you stronger and better for what is to come later. Once again, that battle of ideas between Christianity and humanism. Now the last arena that Harari mentions in his book, Homo Deus, is that man is trying to become godlike through his own means. We find in the teachings of the Bible that man can become godlike through being born into that family of God. But let's look a little bit at what Harari's talking about with man becoming godlike here and now. He mentions a scripture in the Bible, actually. He turns to Deuteronomy chapter 11. So I'm going to turn there just to let you know what he's saying. And in Deuteronomy chapter 11, we have God talking to Israel here, and He's letting them know that if they want rain to fall, they're going to have to worship Him and follow Him. So in Deuteronomy 11, picking it up in verse 13, And it shall come to pass, if you hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God and to serve Him with all your heart and with all your soul, that I will give you the rain of your land in His due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thy oil. And, and God says, if you don't follow me, if you don't do what I tell you to do, then I will take this stuff away from you. Now that's interesting because what Harari says about this scripture is, we don't need God to take care of us anymore with rain. He says we can get the water by our own means. And he brings up the idea of desalination plants and water pipelines that push water into desert areas and people are able to grow crops today. So in a sense, he's saying that if the people back then were alive today, they would look at our technology and think of us as being godlike in a way. Because we could bring water to the desert and cause the crops to grow today by our own means. Now, he not only says that about becoming godlike, but he pushes the envelope even further. And here's what he gets into. Do you know today there are scientists who are studying DNA who are saying that we can manipulate our DNA to evolve ourselves into a greater type of a being? Now again, that's a little scary to me that there are people out there contemplating that. And for ethical concerns, that hasn't happened yet, but we're right on the threshold of that. Scientists know how to do that and what that might lead to, but that idea scares me a little bit when I think about it. But Harari says if we do that in the future, we may evolve ourselves to another type of being that we aren't today. Of course, he believes in evolution, that we have evolved from lesser beings. I do not believe in evolution. I believe we were humans from the beginning, and that's what we are today. But again, because of these humanistic ideas, these ideas about manipulating DNA are there and what they may lead to. Some other concepts out there about making us become godlike. You've probably heard of the science fiction stories about cyborgs, about turning robots into part human, part machine type beings. That technology is out there today. There are scientists contemplating how to do that. They're contemplating how to download our consciousness into computers, into robots. And what they foresee in the future is that as man's biology disintegrates or goes away, we can live on within machines. That is out there, folks. People are talking about that as they contemplate us becoming godlike. You may have seen the movie The Matrix and understood what that was all about, how our consciousness got into the machines in a sense. They believe that the machines may take over someday and that we can program the machines to be like us. And therefore, if we've made life a new life form, a machine with consciousness, then we are gods by creating that. So all of these concepts are out there, prolonging human life through human means, making humans into godlike beings, and putting those beings into space and allowing them, believe it or not, 
to go out into space and explore and evolve space. Now, when you think of those concepts, they seem extraordinary, but God has some similar concepts in this Bible, and we can do it through God giving us that capability rather than man giving us that capability. I'm going to give you one other scripture here over in the book of Hebrews. I talked a little bit about Harari and how the humanists believe they can achieve this godlike status, but the Bible lets us know that God has a road for us to become part of His family. Over in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10, listen to what it says there. Hebrews 2 and verse 10. For it became Him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now these many sons that it's referring to who are going to become glorified are human beings who follow Jesus Christ and go in His direction. They can become glorified. And I know if you've watched this program before, we've talked about numerous other scriptures that talk about the fact that man can be born into the family of God and partake of that divine nature that we're reading about right here in the pages of your Bible. Now, again, there's this battle between humanism and Christianity for the minds of men, but immortality, ultimate happiness, and becoming God-like or part of the family of God can all come to you if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. The efforts of man to achieve immortality, to achieve ultimate happiness, and to achieve God-like status will all fail. God will step in as He stepped in at the Tower of Babel and said, it won't be beyond man's imagination to do whatever he wants if I don't step in now. Well, I think we're right at that precipice once again as we look out at man's history going forward. But in order to do this, you've got to have that relationship with God. Again, I want you to remember uh, what we're offering on today's program. We'd like you to get that free literature, Christ, Why Christ Must Return, and we want you to get that free CD, Maintaining Happiness. Get that CD, get that booklet, they will help you understand a little bit more about the concepts we've been discussing today. Call us toll free at 1-888-578 8791. That's 1 888 578 8791 or visit our website www.cgi.org. That's www.cgi.org. Get the booklet, get the CD, learn more about how God is going to give you happiness, immortality, and membership in the God family. Bye for now. Armor of God and the free material offered is brought to you by The Church of God International of Tyler, Texas. You may write to us at 3900 Thames Street, Tyler, Texas 75701 or call toll free at 1-888-578-8791 or call one 939 2929 during regular business hours. You may visit our website at www.cgi.org or email us at armorofgodcgi.org. We appreciate your prayers and support. This program is sponsored by The Church of God International and supported by our viewers.